afternoon, uh, titled Green Energy as a Rural Economic Development Tool Project, of First Nations and Renewable Energy Opportunities. Um, my name is Amy Schneider, and I'm in the Economic Development Division of the Ministry of Jobs, Tourism, and Skills Training. So as always, we hope that uh, this webinar will provide everyone on the line with a link to new information and will enable some discussion between experts in an affordable and accessible and sustainable way. Uh, as Darby just mentioned, the webinar is being recorded and then will be archived on the Rural BC website. And so then we'll have a lasting resource of today's session um, for, for those of you on the line and others who are unable to join us today. Um, and I encourage you to look at the, uh, the webinars that are currently on the site already because there may be other topics of, of interest to you. As well, we're certainly keen to get your feedback. So following today's presentation, you'll be, uh, you'll be uh, provided with a survey to let us know um, what your experience was this afternoon and also to get uh, your input on what you would like to see for future topics uh, of our webinar. So now I'm going to introduce our presenters for today's session, starting with Mark Imus. Mark is the Director of Community Economic Development in the Ministry of Jobs, Tourism, and Skills Training. Mark works in the Economic Development Division as well in the Pine Beetle Epidemic Response Branch and is the Provincial Government Liaison to the Southern Interior Beetle Action Coalition. Mark works closely with SIBAC on economic development and diversification projects in the Mountain Pine Beetle Zone of BC's Southern Interior. Next, we have Robert Duncan. And Robert is the CEO of the Upnet Power Corporation, which is primarily owned by the I'm gonna I'm gonna stumble over the name here, the Hupacathis First Nation, which operates the six point five megawatt run of the Red River Green Hydroelectric Project on China Creek on the outskirts of the Port Alberni city limits. Next we have Michael Whedon. Michael is has held senior finance and general management positions in industry with over 25 years of experience. Most recently, as a consultant in the environment sector, he has evaluated a number of alternative energy technologies, including many in the bioenergy sector. In addition to being appointed executive director in September 2008, Michael is also a member of the board of the BC Bioenergy Network. And our last presenter is Paul Donald. And Paul is the Business Development Manager for All Nations Development Corporation located in Kamloops, BC. Paul and his team at All Nations put financing and funding together for Aboriginal entrepreneurs, whether they be individuals or communities. And Paul is also a member of the First Nation. So I'm just quickly going to review the agenda that we'll be going through today. So we've already crossed off the first couple items. So Mark is going to lead us off and talk about the green energy as a rural economic development tool project. Then Robert will talk about uh, the China Creek project. Michael will follow and um, give an overview of um, bioenergy research and technologies. And then Paul Donald will be talking about funding options and opportunities available to First Nations for renewable energy projects. As Darby mentioned, we'll have a discussion at the end of the session, and I encourage you all to to, uh, to participate in that discussion because we have lots of people on the line, so, so we'll be able to get a variety of perspectives and input in that discussion. And then we'll finish up hopefully right at 3 o'clock and, um, and let you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. So um, no, I think I'll just turn it over directly to Mark. And Oh, sorry, we're going to have a quick poll to begin with. There's our fabulous poll graphic. <laughs> Um, so, yes, thanks, Amy. Thanks very much. Um, we, we did put t uh, together four different poll questions here. So, great. I can see people jumping on this now. So, um, you can, as an attendee, just actually click on the, the color right on the slide in front of you. It's not the feedback uh, button up on the top right-hand corner, but the <laughs> slide in front of you. So, are you involved in developing a renewable energy project? So, please, if you could vote on that now. And looks like uh, everyone may have... Oh. Okay, we're still getting some movement on that. And Janelle is going to just take a, a tally here. Once once we get to a, a point where she can make a bit of a tally, so still a bit of movement there. We'll give it a second or two more. People changing their mind. Okay, maybe we'll leave it at that one. Okay, great. Next one, please. Or 
text here. Do you wish to get involved in developing renewable energy projects? So yes, I'm not currently involved in a renewable energy project, but I'd like to be. No, I'm not currently involved in and do wish to become involved in developing a renewable energy project, or I am already involved in developing a renewable energy project. So, oh. And I think I may have hidden these, and I'm sorry if I didn't show the uh, first one, um, but I can certainly show the results here for this next one, and certainly we're strongly weighted on actually developing projects here. So, yeah, seems to be fairly solid there to now. Okay, got that. Super, thanks. Great, and if you don't mind, we just got two more here. So what is your, what is your background? Local government, First Nation government, provincial government, private sector, nonprofit, or other, and I'll show you the results. Quite a bit of a range. Okay, a little, a little more in the private sector. We got a bit of movement here, and a little more scribbling for Janelle here as well. So. Let me know, Janelle, when you're when you're ready there. I know they're moving still a little bit. <laughs> one more question for you after this one here, and just get to go. Thank you. And so, what is your current level of knowledge around renewable energy projects? Please vote, and this will certainly help uh, well get a better sense of just uh, how best to gauge the uh, the information that they're providing today. And I can see we have some knowledgeable people aboard. Wonderful. So we'll certainly a range. Um, certainly most very knowledgeable. Great. Janelle, just uh, let me know when you're ready. Looks like they're actually coming to, uh, coming to a finish pretty quick. There. Good to go? Okay, fabulous. We're off. Mark, and there's that graphic here. One more time. And yeah, good afternoon. It will hopefully let you get over. There you are. Thanks, Mark. All right. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as uh, Darby and Amy said, uh, I'm Mark Hymas with the uh, Ministry of jobs, tourism, and skills training. Uh, my presentation will give you an overview of the Green Energy as a Rural Economic Development Tool Project, uh, the purpose and objectives of the project, and the funding partners involved. As well, I'll tell you about some of the information and tools uh, that are available and that have been developed through the Green Energy Project. So uh, this just uh, that's, that's what I'm going to cover in my presentation. The next slide, just to give you a bit of context, why are renewable renewable energy projects important to rural BC? Uh, according to Paul Korea, who's the executive director of the Clean Energy Association of BC, the clean energy sector has created about 18,000 person years of employment as of last year. Many of these jobs are in First Nations and rural communities, and the clean energy sector itself has con contributed more than $2 billion to the province's economy while contributing over $378 million to government for public services, which is valuable for things like hospitals and schools. Uh, together, when the 27 projects in Hydro's last call are built, there's, that could deliver another 3,800 person years of, of employment, uh, construction employment, and an additional 3.8 uh, billion dollars in capital investment. So it's, it's a very important sector to our economy in BC. First Nations are a significant player in this sector. 125 First Nations participate either through direct ownership, equity, uh, investments, and various partnership agreements that uh, vary around the province. Uh, so clean energy has really opened the door uh, for greater opportunities and a better economic future for First Nations in BC in general. So supporting this sector 
is a priority of the Beetle Action Coalitions who are uh, interested in advancing uh, economic development and diversification in the interior. And uh, it's a priority for the local government and First Nations that participate on their boards. Going to the next slide, uh, the purpose of the project is to increase rural knowledge of green energy opportunities and to develop new tools that will facilitate increased rural benefits from green energy development in the, in the mountain pine beetle epidemic zone of BC. Uh, this picture on the slide here is just a picture of the Lake Country microhydro facility, which I'll, I'll talk more a bit uh, about later. Uh, major components and objectives of the project are to work directly with a number of small communities and First Nations in the Epid Mountain Pine Beetle Zone to assist them in furthering their proposed green energy development projects and concepts, and to create and circulate a variety of green energy information resources and tools to rural communities and First Nations throughout the Pine Beetle Zone and assist them with identifying and developing green energy opportunities in their respective communities. There's a number of communities out there that have ideas about what they think uh, could be developed in their region based on their uh, local resources, and so this project is really uh, trying to help them realize those opportunities. Some of the other uh, uh, components and objectives uh, to work with the green energy uh, industry organizations and businesses to identify and implement actions to increase rural benefits from green energy development in BC's interior, and to organize and deliver a series of uh, different outreach and knowledge extension activities throughout rural BC. And uh, this webinar is, is one of the ways in which we're trying to get the word out about the project and the, uh, the, the tools and information that we're collecting as a result. A little bit about uh, the project funding partners. Um, in, a, in addition to um, our ministry uh, of jobs, tourism, skills training and in the Pine Beetle Epidemic Response Branch, uh, Gordon Borgstrom uh, was the developer of the project and as an in-kind contribution to the project is the project manager for this. And uh, the, other, the other partners are Canada's Rural Partnership, which is the Government of Canada. Uh, and the three Beetle Action Coalitions, so the Caribou, Chilcotin, uh, the Yamanika, and the Southern Interior Beetle Action Coalition are partners. Uh, the Southern Interior Coalition is the project administrator, as well as the Columbia Basin Trust uh, is another funder. Um, we, we do have a project advisory committee that consists of uh, the funding organizations uh, as well as we do have some technical advisors that participate on that advisory committee. And uh, we've also been fortunate to have uh, Ted Sheldon from the Climate Action uh, Secretariat Group and government participate on that as well. Uh, this is just a screenshot from the project website, uh, ruralbcgreenenergy.com. So uh, this is where you can find uh, the information and uh, tools and reports that have been developed through the project. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a bit more detail on what you can find here, but, uh, but it, you may want to make note of that uh, uh, URL. And, and as Darby says, uh, you'll, you'll have access to this presentation after the webinar. That's ruralbcgreenenergy.com. Uh, next slide, just a, there's a four key tabs that uh, have these graphics that are shown here. Uh, one tells you a bit more about the project than, than what I'm giving you here today. Another one is uh, the reports and tools. Uh, and a third one is project case study reports and videos and presentations. And uh, I'll give you a bit more detail about what's, what's under each one of those right now and, and what's, what's under development in the next few slides. So under uh, project reports and tools, uh, currently we have the uh, North Thompson Green Energy Opportunity Scan Report uh, is up there and we partnered with uh, SIMC First Nation, uh, District of Clearwater and District of Barrier um, as well as uh, the Thompson-Nicola Regional District looking at what are the, 
uh, energy opportunities in the North Thompson that uh, that these communities could could take advantage of, and uh, they were interested in learning what where the highest potential was for them given their their local situation. Another uh, report is uh, powering our province, an analysis of the clean energy business and workforce opportunities in DEC. And uh, as you can see on the slide there, the, the North Thompson uh, scan report was done by Community Energy Association and the uh, Powering Our Province one was done by Globe Advisors. There's also an interim uh, progress report on their um, date of May 2012, gives you a bit more uh, detail about the project. Uh, there, we have also a Green Energy Information Resources Guide, uh, which has a, a quite a bit of information about different uh, resources that are out there uh, on the green energy in the green energy sector, uh, broken down into different subtopic areas. Uh, so this includes, you know, sort of book references as well as websites and uh, just a bunch of information that we've been able to collect. Uh, there's a biomass fact sheet, and uh, you can see on this slide, I've taken a little uh, uh, clipping out of that fact sheet, and uh, this is useful for people that uh, maybe are trying to wrap their head around uh, uh, biomass and explain this to uh, to the general public or for uh, uh, political organizations to understand. What do we mean by one cubic meter of wood? Well, it equates to about one power pole. Um, and then that translates into uh, 757 pounds or 0.344 ton, tons of bone dry chips. Uh, we've got some good feedback on that fact sheet, um, which has uh, got some useful information. And uh, some of the other reports that we have under development uh, are there's a small hydro feasibility study for the District of Clearwater, uh, SIMP First Nation, uh, and the City of Armstrong. So this goes into more detail than that uh, high-level scan I mentioned earlier, uh, and was really intended for those uh, governments to determine uh, whether they should go to the next phase uh, on developing a uh, small-scale hydro project in their area. As well, uh, we've got a project to look uh, with at the village of Valemount's potential around geothermal energy. Um, and developing a system there, so that's a pre-feasibility study. Uh, given they're along the Rocky Mountain Trench, they've got some pretty significant geothermal potential underground, so they're looking at that. And as well, we have a, uh, another report under development called Green Energy Projects and Utilities and Investment Governance Case Study Guide for BC local governments and First Nations. And that one should be uh, coming out soon, and that's uh, uh, being developed by the Community Energy Association for us. Some of the uh, uh, shifting over to case study reports, uh, we do have uh, currently posted the District of Lake Country. There's a case study uh, that was written by uh, Jack Allingham, uh, who's one of the technical advisors on our, our project advisory committee that uh, describes uh, the District of Lake Country's experience in developing a, a micro hydro power plant. Um, as well, uh, we've got a couple of future case studies that are coming. Uh, one is the Little Wit Recreation Center biomass heating system, uh, which is uh, currently operating. So we're having them write up their experience and some of the challenges and, and uh, some of the successes they've encountered. And, and, and it'll tell you uh, more about uh, how it's helped them to save money, what the environmental benefits have been. And, uh, and how it's been received in the community. Um, as well, the Oopnet Power uh, Project, uh, which Robert is going to talk more about uh, next uh, as the next presenter, um, but uh, we're, we're writing up that case study as well about the China Creek Small Hydro Project um, that was developed by uh, the Oopnet the First Nation. So that uh, photo on this slide is uh, shows you the construction of the intakes and in the spillway at uh, China Creek um, about seven years ago. So moving on to uh, videos and presentations. Uh, currently, we have uh, the following three videos, the District of Lake Country. Um, so at this 
same time the case study was being written, we also uh, developed a video uh, that, that um, gives you a better sense of what the project looks like and uh, narrated by Jack Allingham and interviews a number of people in the community, talks about that project. Uh, there's a video on the UNBC, uh, University of Northern BC bioenergy project at their campus in Prince George. And, uh, and then there's also a video um, which is taken from Global TV News that was done on the Fink Machine Biomass a District Heating Project, which is in Enderby, BC. And then uh, along with the case study for Oopnet Power, China Creek, uh, we will have a video uh, for that one as well. So uh, that concludes my presentation. I wanted to answer any questions you might have uh, about the project, and so I'll, I'll just uh, stop there. Thanks very questions. much, Mark. Appreciate that. Great presentation. Um, and yeah, what we'd like to do now is just uh, open it up for a question or two. We've just got a couple minutes here before uh, before turning it uh, turning it over to Robert. So I can see uh, Ted Sheldon, by the looks of it, um, is is. Uh, has his virtual hand raised, and I'd uh, invite others uh, also to ask any questions they may have, and you can do that again through the Q&A button at the top or just by raising your virtual hand through the feedback button. But uh, to, to uh, actually bring Ted aboard here, um, what I'd ask everyone to do is to please mute their line. Oh, Ted, we may have lost Ted actually there. <laughs> he may have put his virtual hand down. <laughs> oh, he's back. <laughs> So if I could ask everyone to please mute their line, um, star six, and I will uh, unmute the, the conference out of lecture mode, and Ted, you'll be free to ask your question. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Hi, Ted, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, please, go ahead. This is really, um, it, as you know, uh, Mark, I'm very jazzed to be just, just trying to hang on to your folks' uh, coattails uh, as you undertake these uh, these different projects in rural BC around the uh, right all around the province, as far as you right now you've got uh, you've got Rana River, you're looking at geothermal and uh, and um, and biomass, of course. I think uh, the, I guess the Fink machine, particularly at the District of Energy of uh, of Enderby. Are there any other projects for kind of forecast uh, going down? Uh, Going into the future, that might get at any of the, of the other renewables. Or a second related question is: uh, is uh, biomass, particularly coming out of uh, the Fink machine with the District of Energy of uh, Enderby, that just seems to have so much potential around the province. And wondering uh, either a if there's uh, if if you're giving some thought going down the road to uh, to other rural communities, or even even more importantly, what feedback have you got from other rural communities to date that uh, would suggest uh, the possible portability of some of these best practices, like the one in Enderby, to other communities? Great question, Ted. Um, as far as other renewables, um, right now one. One that I, I haven't mentioned, uh, is, which again is biomass, uh, would be to look at uh, opportunities in the Caribou Tokoten around uh, heating with wood waste of some of the, the some of the schools. It's, but as far as um, uh, solar or or wind, we don't currently have any projects uh, looking at that specifically under this green energy project. Um, so. Really, these uh, the ones that we do have have come forward through the funding partners, through the Beetle Action Coalition, and uh, and just sort of canvassing the local governments and First Nations. Um, well, there's certainly a nice uh, a nice range of them uh, to date. So that's uh, just kudos for you folks. If I can prematurely, or just uh, a wonderful project. Yeah, and I think the initial response has been good as far as the tools that are being developed, and uh, we're hoping to, you know, do more of this kind of outreach and uh, and get get the word out in a, in a bigger way so that, uh, you know, as many uh, local governments and First Nations are aware of the project and the tools and the reports and resources that have been collected. So, um, so yeah, we're certainly open to any suggestions you might have in terms of uh, getting the word out about the project. You bet. 
Thanks very much, Ted. Thanks. Thanks very much. Much, Mark. Um, we do have a couple more questions actually in the Q and A's. Um, if I may, I'd ask you just to hold those questions, keep them in the queue, and perhaps we can revisit those in the discussion so that we can uh, just continue with uh, the presentations we have and make sure we uh, we do get to all of them while holding that discussion <coughs> at the end. So um, I would like to turn things over next um, and over to, to Robert Duncan. So. Robert, and I am just going to go back to lecture mode just to ensure that we're not uh, being interrupted at all. The conference is in lecture mode. Great, Robert. Are you there? I'm here. Good afternoon. I'm. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and really to share uh, uh, Patrick's uh, experience uh, with uh, the China Creek Project and talk a little bit about uh, the process uh, that the nation went through, as well as uh, future opportunities uh, that we're looking at uh, going forward. So, uh, just a real quick overview of uh, of, of China Creek and, and OpenNet Power. Uh, OpenNet Power, uh, the limited partnership, is made up of, uh, and some would call it a, a very unique uh, cast of characters. OpenCast that uh, owns 72.5 percent of it. Senate Synergy. Uh, Twelve and a half percent. Uh, the Utila First Nation, ten uh, percent. The city of Port Alberni, five percent. Uh, Upnit Power Corporation, uh, Power Corporation which is uh, essentially uh, ourselves, ourselves as general partner and responsible for the day-to-day -day management uh, of, uh, of the project. And Hi, Robert. Is, Sorry, uh, I'm just going to interrupt here. We just have some feedback, and it may be coming. Uh, Essentially, actually, from the other presenters. So I'd, I'd ask all of us at this point to please mute your mute your line. Star six, with the exception of you, Robert, of course. And uh, and then uh, hopefully that'll reduce that feedback we're getting. And, and Robert, if you don't mind, just uh, perhaps speaking just a little bit louder, and that may uh, resolve issues here. So please go ahead. Alrighty. Okay. And hoping everyone can uh, hear me okay. Uh, the, the, again, just continuing on. The project is uh, six and a half megawatts. Uh, it's located in the China Creek uh, watershed, obviously. Uh, the penstock uh, for, for this project is 4.6 kilometers uh, from the intake uh, down to the powerhouse. And it, uh, it's unique in the nature as it is a shared water supply. The city of uh, Port Alberni's uh, intake uh, for, our, for our potable water for the city is actually in between the intake for China Creek and the powerhouse. So. We certainly are mindful of that uh, during the course of our operations and work very closely with the city's engineering department. There are a number of elements, of course, uh, related to these projects, uh, and a lot of them are a lot of fun, uh, and it, it certainly takes the time to, to get through the process. Uh, typically, you're looking at about 30 to 40 approving agencies. Uh, some of the significant ones, of course, are, are fisheries, <coughs> environmental, and uh, certainly for us, most importantly, in, in developing these projects, most important is, is the hydrology uh, for these projects. Uh, then, of course, is dealing with BC Hydro and other agencies as part of the process. The standing offer program sets out uh, the various elements as part of the EPA, which is the Energy Purchase Agreement. Uh, the 2010 call uh, for power changed uh, slightly in terms of the standing offer program, if some may recall. Uh, previously, it was uh, 10 megawatts or less. Uh, you were very much part of the standing off for program. Uh, the 10 megawatts has jumped up to 15 megawatts now. Uh, so any projects of 15 megawatts or less are, are part and parcel of the standing off for program. Uh, financing and equity is a very uh, critical element uh, to the process, and I would suggest uh, any of those that are looking towards uh, these types of projects going forward that really bring in a lender in as soon as you can, uh, because this is somewhat and still relatively uh, a new industry, and obviously uh, there's a huge and could be a significant learning curve for numbers that may not have been involved in these projects before. So having a good understanding of the EPA, the standing offer program for lenders, I think is always never a bad thing. Uh, on an annual basis uh, related to the uh, water quality, water temperature, water flows, and such that uh, we monitor and provide reports uh, to the licensing branch on an annual basis. And uh, I had the Harlequin duck up there because it's a bit of a humor story for me. Uh, we studied uh, in the China Creek uh, watershed system 
for one year because uh, someone had made no so uh, they thought that harlequin ducks were nesting in and around this area. Uh, so a significant amount of money and time went into the study uh, and at the end proved there was no ducks in the area. But it's just one of those things that does come up as a matter of course uh, throughout these projects. So. Uh, one has to be very mindful of, of what the impacts are of, of your project. Uh, for us, certainly, uh, the day-to-day -day management is uh, a, a, it's a significant issue for us to deal with. Uh, we're fortunate that uh, we have a couple of the members here that have been involved in the project and in talking about who actually said uh, community members, uh, our plant technician and his assistant are, are both community members, so we're very fortunate that they've been a part of the project since day one. Uh, we do obviously have to provide uh, BC Hydro invoices uh, at the end of every month and at the 15th of the very following month, uh, uh, we have a direct deposit that goes into our account from BC Hydro. Uh, there's calculations that are done on a daily basis and then tabulated on a monthly basis and then annually uh, we're adjusted on peak hour and, and super peak hour adjustments uh, along the way. <coughs> There's a, a number of elements related to these projects, and, and sometimes they can be uh, uh, a trick to deal with. Uh, we're fortunate in this case here, the penstock, uh, the powerhouse, and intake chamber were all built simultaneously. Uh, although different contractors were involved, uh, certainly there was a, a good deal of uh, coordination that's involved when you do that. And not all penstocks are of this length. Uh, in some cases, they're a lot shorter. Uh, Sable River, for example, which is another project that we're working on, is only a 1,400 meter penstock length. Uh, so they'll vary. And uh, geography and the environment certainly will dictate uh, how and when uh, you can undertake construction in those areas. So engineering and, and other elements are significant factors. Uh, typically, uh, and certainly in this case, uh, the construction of the penstock uh, uh, has a number in, in ballparking at around $1.5 million. The intake, uh, which is the uh, Obermeyer bladder, the weir, the intake chamber, again, another million dollar project uh, for that. And then there's the powerhouse, uh, there's a trash rack cleaner related to the intake chamber. We have a lot of leaves that come down, we have to deal with that because it, it potentially impacts our power production. Uh, the turbines, again, the generators, uh, uh, and what you see in this, this frame here is, is uh, the generator of uh, machine number one and the turbine and generator for machine number two. So we have two machines, and I've sort of noted uh, the delivery issue. Uh, many would think that you can't just order these off the shelf. Uh, typically, delivery times range from 12 months to, in some cases, two years. So one has to be very mindful of that in terms of project development. The powerhouse building that you see here that encases all of uh, all of the electrical and other equipment that's required to uh, run these projects is about was about a million and a half dollars. China Creek overall was a fourteen million dollar project, and if you're looking at ballparking one of these projects, for example, uh, back then, of course, 2005, uh, 2004 is when this project was being developed. We came online in 2006, uh, and it worked out to about $2 million per megawatt. Uh, of course, uh, a couple of years later, the costs have gone up to about $3 million, and now we're looking at about probably $4 million per megawatt that you can just generally throw uh, at a project just to give you some idea of some of the capital costs that are involved. Uh, soft costs, and those are really risk monies, range anywhere from half a million to a million dollars, and that's sort of the, the standard uh, out there in the industry right now. Um, and that's, uh, you know, the risk side of it is really determining uh, the viability, the feasibility of these projects. And I can't stress enough the importance of undertaking uh, hydrology assessment. In some cases, will take a couple of years to do to get some really solid numbers. And then that includes and involves, obviously, putting data loggers into the system, which will give you a good idea of uh, the flow of the water and, and it'll measure temperatures and other qualities, of course, uh, which are all important, important for uh, determining uh, the amount of water that can be taken out of the system without negatively impacting that system, obviously, and there's fish and other considerations that are all part and part of that assessment. 
uh, once you've determined the hydrology and how much you can take out of a system, that will really determine at the end of the day uh, what your revenue generation is. And, of course, uh, the 2010 call, uh, the base rate for this region uh, in 2006 was 58000 per gigawatt hour. Uh, in 2010, that changed to 102000 per gigawatt hour. So a significant change, but also what's gone up is the cost. Uh, spoke briefly about uh, uh, future opportunities for Hupacha Set. Uh, we're currently working on the Sable River project, which is another six and a half megawatt run of river project, and we're ballparking anywhere from 21 to 25 million dollars uh, for the for the uh, capital cost of that project. And again, uh, similar to uh, the UPNIT uh, limited partnership, we are working with uh, a couple of other partners: the Comox First Nation, located obviously in Comox and Island Timberlands, who's the owner of the lands uh, that would be developed in this project on. So we're going through a, a variety of uh, due diligence elements related to this project and somewhat hopeful that we can get in the ground with it next year. A lot of time and energy has gone into it already. Uh, Plitzer Creek, uh, Executive House Power, uh, again, three to four megawatt run of river project on the lower end side because it isn't that big of a project. Uh, and we're going to be a minority partner uh, in that development, and we're just undergoing uh, a variety of different due diligence elements related to that project currently. Uh, Great Central Lake, uh, currently no partners identified. Uh, this is a uh, different than this uh, run of river, of course. It's uh, micro hydro, uh, three to four megawatts, and we're ballparking anywhere from 10 to $15 million. It is part of an existing dam structure, which is currently owned by Catalyst uh, Paper, and uh, we have uh, an understanding with Catalyst with regards to the ownership of the facility. We're going through some training right now with regards to uh, the operation of the facilities, and expect that, that will take another six to six months to a year to finalize elements related to that. Uh, we did have a look at uh, some of the elements related to the potential there and are currently looking at uh, furthering uh, that investigation to better determine uh, the risk associated uh, with that opportunity. Uh, so certainly from, from our point of view, success breeds success and provides uh, more often than not uh, future opportunities. That's my time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Robert. Great presentation, and again, if there's any questions out there, we certainly welcome uh, welcome them at this time. We've got a, a few minutes to uh, take one or two here. Uh, we did have a couple of existing questions. I think they were more targeted at the previous presentation, but uh, again, please, if there's any questions now, we can take those, and we'll give you a, a couple seconds here to either enter those in the, the Q&A at the top or uh, raise your virtual hand through that feedback button in the, on the right-hand side. I have a question. Um, it's Shannon Mason here. I'm just wondering, what was sort of the biggest challenge you guys had at the beginning in terms of getting this project up and going and started? Financing. Financing? Yeah, financing and, and equity, bringing equity into the project. Uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, likely the first First Nations uh, majority-owned and operated uh, facility in the province. So. Uh, bringing a significant amount of equity into a project was uh, certainly then was the challenge. There's more opportunities out there now than there ever was, which is a good thing, and I think good opportunities for other First Nations. But uh, that was the hugest challenge to overcome. Uh, there are a number of challenges, but certainly that was one of the bigger ones. What advice would you have for somebody, uh, for another First Nation that wanted to undertake something like this in terms of making it, uh, sort of smoothing it out in terms of trying to get the financing and the equity, was there any sort of key elements that they could, that would help them get ready to ask, you know, to, to, to pursue the financing? Well, uh, what, what I, I've been asked a number of times for a number of First Nations, and I would say get your hydrology done, because hydrology really at the end of the day is what determines uh, what sort of income a project uh, potential would uh, would make on an annual basis, and that really will dictate uh, and determine. Uh, one hand will tell you 
perhaps how much finance you'll need, but on the other hand, uh, more importantly, it'll also determine and, and show you how much equity you need to bring into a project to be viable. Um, I guess a quick example of that would be Sable River, which we run some analysis on really quickly and, and really rough numbers in terms of looking at it. And uh, that told us, you know, it, it, here's the level that the income from this project would support. And if your project is more or less than what that number is, then obviously uh, that will tell you very clearly uh, how much equity you need to bring into these projects uh, to make them feasible. Because, it, you know, at the end of the day, they do need to be feasible. You, you can't build a $30 million project and only have a uh, million and a half dollars in income. That It just obviously doesn't fly that way. Uh, one other thought, and certainly for us going forward, is to look at the sort of a management team approach, and that means uh, more than just us, bring in your lender as part of the, uh, the management team. Uh, bringing in some outside expertise in terms of in, in environmental or engineering, and even legal to that extent, because uh, the energy purchase agreement and other elements connected to these projects can be complicated, and getting good legal advice as well as all of the other protocols that are required is uh, it's always a good thing. And, and, and I, I like the idea of a, a management team approach, and that way a number of elements can be covered off at uh, one time. Thanks very much, Robert. And I did see a couple more questions there, but uh, I think our, our time is growing a little bit short here. So uh, please hold those questions for a discussion later. And uh, I'd like to turn things over now to Robert. There's Michael there. You may need to unmute your line, star six. and. There's your slide. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And I, I want to thank uh, Jobs Tourism and Skills Training for the opportunity to participate here. Uh, uh, my presentation is going to focus upon a, a project that is under the development with uh, the Quadacha First Nation. Uh, we've entitled this uh, case study, Energy Independence and an Economic Development Solution for the Quadacha First Nation. Uh, but before I turn to that, I just want to mention that the BC Bioenergy Network uh, is uh, is a not-for-profit organization that was founded in March of 2008, and we received a, a generous funding, uh, a $25 million grant from the BC Ministry of Energy, Mines, and Petroleum Resources, uh, and the Ministry of the Environment to, in the simplest of terms, accelerate the development of bioenergy in BC. Uh, we have a mandate that's built into our, our, our constitution. And at this point in time, we have, in the, in the past uh, three, almost four years now, we have uh, 19 different projects, 19 large projects and 10 capacity building projects. Um, we've committed over 15 million of the uh, 25 million by way of uh, a grant and uh, uh, loans and uh, an equity investment. Uh, and our total investment to date uh, on these projects is $116 million. Uh, this uh, particular presentation is going to focus upon uh, one project that we uh, want to make happen in conjunction with the community of, of uh, Quadacha, the First Nations community. And in terms of the presentation, I'm going to discuss and outline the ultimate goal and provide you some background relating to this project. Uh, I want to evaluate the energy options for the community and provide you with a project update. There are approximately 60 communities in BC uh, that are remote communities that rely upon uh, uh, diesel uh, electricity generation. And most of these uh, uh, communities are actually First Nations communities. Um, and uh, we have been working with the Quadacha First Nation uh, in, a, in fulfilling a goal that they have. That is very simply to implement an energy plan uh, which is consistent with the goals, aspirations, financing, and human resource capabilities of, of, of Quadacha within the boundaries of acceptable risks and expected benefits. Indeed, we're looking to uh, fund and make a project uh, happen that will be a model for other remote communities. Uh, in terms of uh, 
background, uh, we have been working in conjunction with the BC First Nations Energy and Mining Council, the BC uh, First Nations Sports Council, and the community of Quadacha. We started out with the, the two advisory First Nations groups uh, through a tripartite agreement, uh, and ultimately were in introduced to the Quadacha First Nation. Um, and now, uh, what I'd like to do is share with you the bioenergy options for the uh, for the community. Okay, there are principally four options. Uh, and the, the first option is to, to stick with the status quo. And that basically would rely upon BC Hydro for future electricity needs. And in all likelihood, that would be through diesel generation of, of power. The next level option was to focus in on a biomass solution for the major buildings in the, in the community. And that would utilize a woody biomass system to displace propane with a proven and reliable low risk system. Uh, BC Hydro would continue to be responsible for electricity supply. So this option just looks at the heating requirements for the community. And there are many advanced uh, combustion systems in the world, uh, clean, clean systems uh, that would satisfy this need. The third option is to move into electricity generation. Combine the biomass as well as meet the base load power requirements for the community. And this basically would utilize woody biomass, base propane and diesel, and then we would still be relying upon DC hydro for peak demand and backup energy needs. The fourth uh, option is uh, in indeed the uh, biomass heating and full power for the community. And that's to meet not only the, the baseload energy requirements of the community, but the peaking requirements. And in terms of these options, the level of difficulty of each one, it really in, in, in increases as you go from one to four. It, uh, it places a responsibility upon the community uh, for, uh, for their uh, energy uh, needs, uh, both uh, uh, heat and uh, electricity. Okay, let's just step through quickly through the options so you understand what we're talking about here. This is option two. This is using biomass heating to displace uh, propane. And here's an example of a, of a, uh, of a, uh, a picture of a, of a system, uh, a heating system uh, that would meet the, the needs of the community. Here's a little pictogram, a cartoon of what the what the piece of equipment looks like, uh, and, and this is basically an advanced combustion system. Over here, this picture here is the picture of the school in the community, and this is the largest energy user in the community currently on propane. Uh, and uh, down here, uh, we've got a picture of uh, an engineering drawing uh, that looks at the area. This is the uh, the the, the the buildings in the middle of the community. When you're using a heat system, you want to tie up all of the buildings through a hot water system, and you want those lines to be short, but it's very economical and efficient. So that's option two. Moving on to option three, uh, we're looking at, at providing the, the base load uh, electricity needs of the community. And in the blue here, you'll see the electricity demand of the community, and you can see that it varies quite significantly over the course of a 12-month period. Uh, the goal in meeting the baseload requirements is to go below uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sort of the lowest level of electricity need in the community so that you can run your operation 24 by 7 on a consistent, reliable basis. This will be an easy system to uh, easiest system to manage. So that's a combined heat and power system, and then you har you harvest the the, the the exhaust and the uh, the heat generated by the generator to make electricity, and you use that to power your uh, your heat uh, uh, heat uh, district uh, uh, water system. Okay, moving on. Uh, 
uh, this, uh, we're going to look at option three, and that particular option could be configured with something like this. You'll have some sort of uh, a, a gasification or thermal unit that produces a gas, a synthetic gas, uh, shown here. Uh, we've got an example of one, and that would be kind of combined up in this example with a, some sort of energy generation uh, 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 device. This is a uh, 633 GE Genbacher uh, natural gas reciprocating uh, engine here. Uh, that's a that's about uh, three times the size of what Quadacha would need for their base load requirement. I'm trying to give you a picture of what that system would look like. And then you would house it in a, in a building or some sort of a containerized uh, system for the, for the community and uh, uh, connect it to the uh, electricity system. Okay, moving on, uh, I want to uh, share you, to share with you sort of the, the, the greenest solutions of all, that's option four. That's taking uh, and dealing not only with the heat in the precinct area, but the base and the peaking load of the community. And here we would be looking at using a renewable resource, uh, uh, wood, um, and in the Quadacha, it's impacted by the mountain pine beetle rather significantly. And then you would just have the diesel generation there as a backup uh, reliability provision. So the, the, the community actually has set upon this as being the goal that they have for the community. Okay. Now, this is the electricity demand profile that's going to have to be met by such a system. Um, and following uh, these peak requirements is, 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 a, is a challenge for a biomass-based system. Uh, and, and that's really the, the, the uh, 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 you know, the challenge of this particular option. Uh, but to see this option in terms of a picture, it's basically an option three that we saw previously, but you're doubling it up. But then, of course, you have to be able to meet these peaking requirements, and you need to be able to integrate with BC Hydro. So that's option four. Uh, all right, in terms of our project update, I want to share with you where we are. Uh, we uh, re requested ex expressions of interest from interested uh, technology providers some time ago. Uh, actually, 27 participants participated in our, our webinar on this subject, um, but three proposals were received. Um, we have undertaken an independent parallel to technical evaluation of these proposals. And the independent reviews actually came up with the, with the same conclusions. And they recommended the top four uh, technologies, uh, and they were the same, and they were short, shortlisted for comprehensive financial and technical review. Uh, we've uh, had uh, underway discussions with uh, BC Hydro for an energy purchase agreement. Uh, we've uh, engaged uh, FP Innovation uh, uh, assist in the development of a sustainable harvesting plan for a couple of options for the community. And, and by the way, uh, this confirmed the, uh, the, the vast abundance of biomass nearby able to, to fuel the needs of the community on a sustainable basis. Uh, in fact, uh, using the biomass in the community would actually mitigate the fire risk that uh, uh, such communities are often exposed to. Uh, we've been meeting with uh, the chief and band council uh, and community leaders throughout. Uh, this, uh, well, we have been supporting them. Ultimately, the decision to proceed will be theirs. Uh, but we've been working together as uh, in, in partners in this project. And finally, we've gone so far as to develop the energy piping requirements. Uh, they've been examined, and uh, the ener engineering for the precinct area, that's the dense area in the community, has largely completed. Okay. Uh, uh, let me just talk, give you an update on the four leading technologies that are being evaluated. Uh, the first is an advanced combustion system using organic Rankine cycle uh, generator. Uh, ORC, or organic Rankine cycle, Engines are, are widely used in Europe. Uh, they tend to be uh, expensive, uh, more expensive at least to other alternatives, 
but they are a uh, highly reliable and proven source of, uh, of energy widely used in Europe. Uh, the second option examined was an advanced gasification system using a reciprocating uh, engine generator. Um, and and uh, this uh, uh, technology is, is uh, widely dispersed in many parts of the world. And then there were two other options. These were uh, lower cost options. One is a low cost gasification system uh, using a reciprocating engine generator. And the fourth is a novel uh, lower cost hydrogen gas engine system using a diesel or a spark ignition uh, natural gas reciprocating engine. Um, now, uh, two of these uh, options, uh, after a very close financial uh, examination and modeling, were determined not to be feasible given the expected pricing available from BC Hydro. Now, we've had discussions with Hydro, uh, and uh, we, we, we do not yet have an EPA with them, uh, but we are trying to explore uh, uh, op the options that where they would be comfortable uh, with entering into a long-term EPA. In fact, such an EPA is absolutely essential to the, to the financing of such a project. And we've prepared recommendations for the community, which I'll now share with you. Uh, we are recommending a phased approach, um, and as follows. Uh, the first phase would be the installation of a biomass boiler, uh, a small system which would likely just be a heat-only system uh, for the precinct area, for the, for the school and the store and the, and the multiple of uh, highly dense buildings in the, in the uh, village uh, core. Uh, the second option was, would be to uh, test a combined heat and power solution uh, in uh, a test location uh, where we have access to uh, lots, of, uh, lots of support, uh, you know, engineering, plumbing, and uh, 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 electrical support. Uh, our assessment of the technologies is that many of them are new and there are few installations in the, in that, that exist. And we wanted to pick a technology that we could ensure uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was fully reliable before moving it and so-called burdening the community with a new, a, a newer technology. Uh, so that's phase two. And actually phase one and phase two uh, can be commenced in parallel. Uh, phase three would be to move the combined heat and power uh, upon successful commissioning, uh, and we're looking at least at 8,000 hours uh, as, as the test, uh, move and commission within the village. And then finally, phase four is to integrate that with the uh, heat-only system and expand it uh, in the fourth phase. Okay. So... Uh, where do we stand? Well, we do have some remaining tasks for completion, uh, but uh, we're well along in this project. We uh, are near to making the final technology selection, uh, and, and as part of that, we will have a, a visit to the community to confirm the plan and the uh, adoption of the recommended solution. Uh, we have had financing discussions uh, underway, but we need to complete our financing plan. Uh, we need to complete the engineering so that we are certain of the uh, uh, of the engineering costs. Uh, uh, and as part of that, we will be uh, doing a request for, for proposals, actually doing the, the contracting of the, the biomass heating system. Um, and uh, we will look to negotiate a combined heat and power uh, purchase terms and, and uh, uh, testing program. Uh, we need to finalize the structuring of the uh, of the uh, own, of the ownership group. Uh, we need to commit with uh, hydro and EPA and uh, a purchase agreement. Uh, and as part of that, we need to uh, uh, complete environmental impact assessment and prepare the site. Okay. Uh, that completes my presentation. Uh, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. And I've got Scott Stanners with me here with the BC Bioenergy Network, and he's working very closely with the community. Uh, 
Uh, back to you, uh, Mark. Thanks, Michael. Um, Darby here. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. We, we are running just a little bit behind. Perhaps, uh, Michael, if you uh, just Michael, have a, a very uh, succinct answer for uh, one question we have from Penny, which is, um, what is happening to the carbonic waste? Uh, well, there will be uh, the carbonic waste. I'm, I'm assuming that you're uh, uh, referring to the ash as, as part of the program. Uh, uh, the ash can be used as a uh, as, an, as a soil amendment. Uh, it, it, uh, it it does depend upon the, the final selection of fuels, but the fuels that we will check will be all natural, uh, and the quantities of uh, of, of uh, ash. Uh, Will be very low. In one of the technology solutions, there will there's the possibility of producing a, a high value added carbon material, uh, an activated carbon material that could be used in uh, in an agricultural uh, application. And the community is considering a small uh, a greenhouse, uh, and it could be suitable for that. Great. Thanks very much, Michael. Thanks for that presentation. We best uh, move on and sure we have time for for. Uh, um, for Paul as well, and also a bit of time for discussion here at the end. So thanks again, Michael. And Paul, it's over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Paul Donald, uh, as was introduced earlier. I work for a company called the All Nations Trust Company, and um, specifically their subsidiary, All Nations Development Corporation. Uh, All Nations Trust Company, we're, we are an Aboriginal-owned trust company. Uh, we've been in business since 1988, and we have 200 Aboriginal shareholders, which include First Nations uh, communities. Um, First Nations are Aboriginal individuals and uh, organizations and businesses, so it's fully Aboriginal-owned. Uh, we're actually one of five Aboriginal capital corporations in BC. Uh, the other uh, Aboriginal capital corporations include uh, Tribal Resources Investment Corporation, uh, Tally Hode Aboriginal Capital Corporation, the First Nations Agricultural Lending Association, and the New Channel Economic Development Corporation. So there's five uh, Aboriginal capital corporations spread throughout BC, and uh, we are one of them. So. All Nations Trust Company, we're based out of Kamloops. We provide, uh, with, with respect to uh, clean energy projects, we provide um, uh, business support uh, in terms of loans, um, financing support. Uh, first, uh, we provide as well the access to the BC First Nations Equity Fund. And we also uh, assist with the delivery of uh, federal funding through uh, Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada. Um, so there's a few pro programs there, the Aboriginal Business Canada or Aboriginal Business Development Program, and the Major Projects and Investment Funds. So those are both federal funding. I'll talk a little bit about those uh, as we move on here. We provide as well business loans. Uh, our most popular loan is the uh, the First Citizens Fund business loan, and that's available through all of the Aboriginal capital corporations in BC. Uh, it's a provincial program. It, it, that loan is specifically for uh, majority Aboriginal-owned businesses that are located in BC. It's eligible for a 40% deferred contribution or a grant, if you will, and it's a maximum of $75,000. Now, one of the things that's occurred in the last uh, few years is that uh, there's been a change. Uh, it used to be $75,000, and for a, for a First Nations community, they could only use it uh, up to the $75,000 limit, and that changed uh, just about a year and a half ago so that uh, First Nations communities can come to uh, access it up to three different times. Uh, so the maximum there now for a community is $225,000 three times the 75. We provide as well business support uh, in terms of assistance with business planning, putting the business financing or funding packages together for individuals or for communities. We will refer different programs if we're not able to assist uh, or someone can help better, then we will definitely provide those referrals. 
and we also provide loan aftercare for clients that have loans with us that are uh, requiring some assistance. Typically, that's uh, with uh, marketing or bookkeeping, that type of thing. We provide them with some of that aftercare assistance. Now, we provide uh, access through to the BC First Nations Equity Fund, and then this is something that um, you know Robert. Uh, Duncan talked previously about you know one of the biggest challenges is access to to um, the, to funding to, or financing to get started up in the in the clean energy project. Uh, the BC First Nations Equity Fund is a five million dollar fund for BC First Nations. And it was established in 2010 uh, to allow the uh, First Nations to have equity participation in green energy projects. So not just um, you know just uh, uh, receiving royalties or taxation benefits, but there actually can be an equity partner. So there's a $5 million fund that we've established, and that was done in partnership with our company, All Nations Trust Company, uh, the New Channel Economic Development Corporation, and the New Relationship Trust. Um, there is also, I should mention as well, another fund very similar that's uh, in partnership with the uh, Tally Hode Aboriginal Capital Corporation and Tribal Resources Investment Corporation. And the, I've put a link there to the Tallyhoed Aboriginal Capital Corporation website or tac.ca and you can find out more information about that. So there are actually two, a couple of different funds there and they're specifically for, again, the First Nations to become equity partners in green or clean energy projects. Okay. So uh, I mentioned before, the federal funding via Aboriginal Business Canada, um, or, or sorry, Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development. One of the programs, the Aboriginal Business Canada program, uh, we deliver that program in the interior of BC. It's uh, their mandate of Aboriginal Business Canada is to increase the number of Aboriginal owned businesses in Canada. Um, <clears throat> They'll provide funding for typically up to 35% of eligible startup costs. Um, there's a maximum for individual entrepreneurs of uh, $99,000, and for First Nations uh, communities, community-owned projects or businesses, it's a $250,000 limit. Um, uh, one of the things I know to, I will note is that the $99,000 for an individual may become more relevant if you have kind of uh, contracting opportunities for uh, for uh, the, your green energy projects. So if, if you have a band member uh, that wants to start up a business and needs to buy some equipment, um, that's definitely right up the, uh, the alley for, for Aboriginal Business Canada. That's what they do. Um, I'll note as well that there are upcoming changes to this program in uh, this fiscal year. Um, but at this point, I, I don't have the details of uh, the idea. Is, the plan is that the program delivery will be rolled out to uh, the Aboriginal Capital Corporations that I've mentioned previously. Um, and that's we're in a bit of a transition period right now. The other uh, federal funding through uh, Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development is the uh, Major Projects and Investment Fund, or MPIF. Uh, that was created in 2008. Uh, specifically to increase the Aboriginal participation in resource and energy projects. Uh, the, most of the projects have been with, with clean energy and with mining at this point, but they're, they're, they're not limited to that. In BC, I know I've uh, looked at their statistics and they've averaged about six projects a year in BC, uh, and most of that was for uh, uh, pre-development costs, for, like things like feasibility studies, uh, environmental assessments, uh, hydrology, um, and the average contribution was uh, in the area of $300,000. So this is a uh, major projects and investment funds is uh, specifically um, directed to community-owned businesses uh, versus the individual-owned. So Aboriginal Business Canada, the uh, major projects and investment funds, they, they'll provide assistance with uh, some of the soft costs that Robert Duncan mentioned earlier, that uh, you know those are kind of uh, monies that you put at risk when you're, you're starting up this, uh, or, or doing the feasibility and determining that this project is going to be worthwhile. 
Um, there's, there, there is funds available for feasibility studies, um, business planning, uh, environmental assessments, doing uh, business valuations, and also for legal counsel. There can be significant dollars spent on partnership agreements, or purchase agreements, that type, type of thing, corporate structure. Those are all kind of eligible costs that uh, you can get some funding for. So I've provided an example of how that could work, um, you know, a feasibility study and or hydrology environmental assessments said that costs you $300,000. Uh, you can't apply through, or the First Nations communities can't, can't apply through uh, MPIP or Aboriginal Business Canada for funding, you know, it typically it's about uh, a 75-25 split. And uh, there's an example there. So that, that mitigates a lot of, or offsets a lot of the risk that the community would otherwise have to, to, to bear on their own when they're starting up a green energy project. Here's an example of um, some funding. Once the um, top costs are, 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 or the studies are complete, um, you know, if you need to, to purchase some equipment um, uh, to get started in the business, there's, there's dollars available for the actual startup as well. And it should be noted that uh, with all of the fun federal funding from, from Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development, it's not a, it's not a situation where they'll fund like 100% of the project costs. Um, there's always going to be a financing component in there, and it's it's going to be significant. Um, but you know, there's uh, um, they're, they're they're there to help offset some of the risk. And again, the financing can come from um, like the BC First Nations Equity Fund um, or the Regeneration Fund. So there, there, there's financing and funding available, and as well, the province has the, the First Nations Clean Energy Business Fund. So that was a, another $5 million fund that was established, again, to increase participation by First Nations in the energy sector. Uh, there is a do There are our dollars for capacity development, again, whether that's feasibility studies, um, hydrology, that type of thing, um, and there's also dollars for equity. I've, I've added the link there for the um, for the Ministry of Aboriginal Relations, the, their, their website there. Uh, the capacity dollar development, or capacity dollars are limited to uh, $50,000 as the cap on that, and uh, the equity contributions, they have a cap on that of uh, $500,000. Okay? So there are resources out there um, to, to help offset the risk when you're starting up a clean energy project, at least for the First Nations owned. Uh, uh, projects or businesses, and I've uh, listed my contact information there for anyone that has any questions. And uh, and again, if, if you're not in my region where I deliver, I would certainly refer you to one of the other Aboriginal capital corporations or the the, the province, to, depending on where where you would best access dollars and and resources. That's it. Thanks very much, Paul. Thanks uh, very much for the presentation there, and we uh, would like to switch things over now to uh, to a, a discussion period, um, and perhaps we should uh, open things up first for, for questions for Paul following his uh, presentation. Um, are there any specific ones for Paul? You're welcome to, again, um, raise your virtual hand through that feedback uh, button in the top right-hand corner, just uh, change it from green proceed to purple, which is question, and uh, the, they'll queue up there and let you speak to speak to opportunities, or again, you can use the Q&A and actually write in your question there. We'll, we'll, we'll go back and revisit some of the questions that are there as well, but um, right now we do have a, a virtual hand raised. If I could ask everyone, um, uh, presenters and attendees alike, just to, to mute your line, and uh, um, then I'll just go off lecture mode here right now, and... We'll be able to ask those, get those persons with their virtual hands raised to ask their questions. So, the conference is no longer in lecture mode. Great, and it would seem that we actually have someone. Uh, the conference is in lecture mode. It would seem someone has actually put their phone on hold, which uh, um, <laughs> removes that ability. So, uh, I see Grace and Heather. You both got questions there. If I could ask you to put those in the in the, the Q and A at this time. 
and uh, unfortunately we're going to have to resort uh, solely to the, the Q&As at this time. And uh, so until you're able to do that, oh, there's Graham, so let's go to his. Um, Graham's question is for, for Paul. So is the five million equity for one project or for all? The five million dollars is for all. So we're talking about um, like the BC First Nations Equity Fund or the Regeneration Fund. That that's, those are five million dollar projects. Okay. Thanks, Paul and Graham. Um, please, uh, yeah, enter if there's any more questions you have to that. Uh, please enter those there. And Heather, you're also welcome to, to enter that in the uh, your question in the Q and A section there. In the interim, I'll, I'll actually go back. I, I believe this question was for uh, Mark Imus, and the question is, how long does the North Thompson Green Energy Opportunity take? How is it funded? How do I get a copy? Mark? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so that particular project took about, uh, I think it was about three and a half months. Um, so it did include uh, site visits by uh, Peter Robinson from the Community Energy Association. And you can access a copy of the report on the Rural BC Green Energy uh, website, ruralbcgreenenergy.com. Uh, there's a copy of it there. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, it, and uh, as far as how it was paid for, it was paid for through the Green Energy Project. So. Uh, I mentioned in my presentation all the different funding contributors that uh, went into developing the green energy as a rural economic development uh, tool project. That's where we got the funding uh, from to pay for that study. Thanks again, Mark. And the next question here was um, from Brian. And uh, there's, there's not too much context around this one. It's uh, tidal and wave, uh, question mark, was the question. Uh, <laughs> that may have been specific to uh, um, the period of time when you're speaking, Mark, but <laughs> is that something you can respond to? Uh, it's, so as far as this green energy project, we haven't had anything that's focused on tidal or wave. Um, Primarily, I think, because we're working in the BC interior uh, and looking at uh, energy options for the mountain pine beetle affected zone. Um, so we, we, have, we haven't really focused on that particular type of technology. Mark, maybe you could just mention. Um, is it live? Is it? Um, if someone was interested specifically in that, though, I think if you Google uh, Highlands and Islands Trust in Scotland, um, they've got a fair amount of experience with uh, tidal uh, power production. So that, that was uh, Gordon Borgstrom, uh, in, uh, Executive Director of our Pine Beetle Response Branch, who's with me here in Kamloops, uh, and is the project manager on the Green Energy Project. So that was Highlands and Islands. Uh, Scotland uh, might have some useful information on that topic. Thanks, Mark and, and Gord. And there's an, another question here from Grim that I believe has not been asked. And the question, hmm, I'm trying to remember who, um, it might have been for, for Robert Duncan. But uh, the question was, any plans to use IC engines operating on syngas processing from biomass? Pretty sure that question was direct to to you, Robert. Does that uh, does that seem to make sense? Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't think that was for me. I think that might have been for Michael. Yeah, I, I, I can address that. There there are a, a number of technologies that uh, use woody biomass uh, to produce a synthetic gas. Uh, some are hydrogen rich, some are not hydrogen rich, uh, but they can be fed into a reciprocating uh, a, a, a diesel engine, uh, uh, typically in quantities up to 70%. Um, and uh, if, the, if the gas is rich enough and clean enough, 
uh, that, uh, and that's a special step that needs to be addressed. They can be used in natural gas uh, spark ignition systems. So th those technologies are available. I, I think uh, that addresses the, the question. Great. Thanks very much, Michael. And this next question is for Paul. Um, how long is the review period for an application, and how um, do you have um, and how do you have an application form? Um, well, there's there's we talked about a couple of different programs there. Um, there's uh, financing right through our Aboriginal Capital Corporation itself, which we just have our own um, uh, application form. It's a fairly you know, short-term review. Um, there's applications for federal funding from Aboriginal Business Canada or the Major Projects Investment Fund. Those ones um, uh, are available online through uh, the Aboriginal Business Canada website, uh, and certainly you can link them. To, you can link through ours at uh, anco.bc.ca. Um, and, and certainly, if anyone's online that wants to. Uh, have access or has any problems or questions with that, uh, I, I can certainly forward you in the application form for that federal funding. Um, and as, in terms of the review period, uh, look, it's changing. Um, I, I don't think you're going to have, an, you know, if you're looking at it for something uh, short term, I don't think federal funding is the way to go, but, um, you know, give yourself at least three to six months to get an answer. But when we're talking about uh, Aboriginal Affairs uh, money. Thanks very much, Paul. And we do have another question here. Oops. And this one's from Heather. Um, a little bit long here. So um, Clean Energy BC has a conference, Generates 2012, at the end of October, which includes a short course. Um, committing it to paper, financing, negotiating, and contracting clean energy projects on Sunday, October 28th. This may be of interest to participants. So, uh, so not so much a question there as as, uh, as a heads up that uh, that conference is in place and there is that, uh, that course that uh, fits particularly well with our subject today. Um, and uh, so that's the, the end of the list of questions we have there right now. Um, and time is growing a little bit late here, so that this is a, a bit of a last call here for any other questions in the, the Q&A, or uh, put that in there and we can address them. Uh, Mark, it's Michael Whedon. Uh, Ted uh, asked at the very beginning about other biomass projects in the province, and uh, of course, long-standing one in so which a few years ago was probably the only one, uh, we did a recent survey, and there's about 50, 50 communities that are considering projects in the province. And, of course, one that's a great example is the, the hydronic system in Prince George, which happens to be the largest uh, system in Canada now, and it was recently commissioned this past year. Thanks, Michael. We do have another question here from uh, Alia. Um, what role do you see demonstration level projects playing in remote communities? It's uh, it's not addressed to anyone particular. Anyone, any presenter wish to address that uh, that question? Uh, I, I will, Mike. It's Michael. Uh, it's absolutely essential. Uh, you know, we, we need these examples, these models for other people to to evaluate. Uh, it reduces the risk. It shows the importance of homework. Uh, I think that we need lots of them. Great. Any of the other presenters wish to speak to that question at all? Again, uh, what do you see demonstration level projects playing in remote communities? Yeah, I, I guess it's Mark, uh, Mark Imus here. I guess uh, just to add to that, I, I think that was one of the primary reasons that uh, Burkhardt Bank of Pink Machine decided to do a district energy system in Enderby was to demonstrate that this could be done and you could actually heat uh, multiple buildings and he put uh, a fair bit of his own money into building that uh, facility and, and putting in the infrastructure uh, for that very reason, just to educate people that this can be done and, and it is a viable uh, source of energy uh, for heating. So 
Um, so I, I think it is very important, and, I, and uh, it is raising the awareness, I think, amongst communities in BC. So the more examples that are out there, the better, in my mind. Thanks very much, Mark, and, and our time is getting very short here. Um, I'm just going to, I think we're going to have to move along here um, for the, to conclude, I would, of course, like to thank all the presenters uh, as as well as our attendees today. And we, we do have a number of resources here available. And, and again, that these uh, the slides are available through that handout section at the top right-hand corner of your your screen um, as well. You can download that right now. Um, and these resources, of course, will be available there for you. Um, we'll also make the slides available through the Rural BC website as well as today's recording. As well, our, our presenters today have kindly made themselves uh, their contact information available. So uh, if we did not get to your question today, uh, please do. Uh, um, you're welcome to contact them directly. And thanks to our presenters for making themselves available for that. Greatly appreciate it. Um, and with that, I would just, again, remind you those materials there, they won't be available forever, the handouts, so please do uh, download those now if you need them. Uh, as well, we'll be putting a survey following today's webinar. We really appreciate you back on the so that we can them um, as good as they can be. And uh, that's everything. So thanks once one last time to all our presenters. And thank you very much.